Welcome back to Hidden History. Today, we're delving into the haunting and largely forgotten story of the SS Jean Nicolet, a Liberty ship whose fate remains one of the Second World War's most disturbing and least known war crimes. Built during the chaos of the Second World War and named after the French explorer Jean Nicolet, this ship was far more than a vessel for cargo. It became a somber stage for a devastating torpedo attack and the subsequent ordeal faced by its crew. So prepare yourselves, history enthusiasts, as we navigate the harrowing, underreported events that make the SS Jean Nicolet a chilling but essential chapter in maritime and wartime history. Trust me, you won't want to miss this. On the night of July 2, 1944, the American Liberty ship Jean Nicolet was sailing west in the Indian Ocean, only 600 miles away from completing its journey from California to Ceylon. The ship was not only manned by its regular civilian crew and a naval armed guard, but also transported 100 passengers, including army officers and civil servants. The Jean Nicolet was laden with nearly 10,000 tons of crucial cargo like steel slabs, industrial machinery, trucks, and unassembled landing boats. The deck was packed with trucks and crates occupying almost every inch, and walkways crossing over the deck cargo for the convenience of gunners and crew. At 7 p.m., the ship's Navy armed guard took their positions at the artillery for general quarters. This was a period when merchant vessels, particularly those sailing unaccompanied through perilous waters, heightened their security measures. Submarines typically lay in ambush around sunset, taking advantage of the dimming light to target ships more effectively. In the ship's control room, Captain D.M. Nilsen felt apprehensive as he surveyed the seemingly endless ocean. All Allied vessels traveling this corridor had been alerted about potential Japanese submarine and surface threats in the area. Nielsen confirmed the ship's course after consulting with the mate about celestial navigation. He then commanded that the current course be maintained for an additional five to six hours. Shortly thereafter, Lieutenant Gerald V. Deal checked his watch and signaled for a stand down from general quarters. Crewmen covered the artillery and secured ammunition containers. Regular night watches were established and deck cadets circulated throughout the ship, enforcing a blackout and ensuring all openings were sealed. At 7.07 p.m., First Assistant Engineer Charles Pyle was at the log desk in the engine room. On one side, a fireman was regulating steam pressure so that the gauge stayed within the safety limits for Liberty ships. To his other side, the large steam engine's pistons moved ceaselessly, just as they had over thousands of nautical miles. Pyle noted the exact moment, he had just glanced at the overhead clock when the torpedo struck. The explosion blew me to the starboard side of the engine room by the pumps. Lucky it didn't knock me into the machinery. That part of the ship remained intact. There was no damage to the boilers or the engine. Everything kept moving, but there wasn't any mistaking what it was. Not out there in the middle of the ocean. A torpedo. I ran immediately to the throttle and stood ready to cut off the steam in case I got word from the bridge. I was standing at the throttle when the second torpedo hit, maybe six seconds later. The explosion knocked me around again, but I kept my feet. I stayed by the throttle for a while, waiting for some communication from the bridge. But nothing happened. No bells over the telegraph and no whistle through the speaking tube. Then the ship started to assume a definite list. We just stood there, waiting. In the engine room, there was no hysteria, no frantic scramble up the ladders that led to the open deck through a labyrinth of machinery, pipes, and boilers. The engine room crew, often called the Black Gang, remained at their stations beneath the waterline, awaiting instructions. The boiler fires were still burning. The pistons and connecting rods moved in their ceaseless cycle. The propeller shaft continued to turn. For a tense five minutes, Pyle, the fireman, and the oiler waited in the ship's underbelly for directives from either the captain or the chief engineer. When none came, and as the ship increasingly listed, Pyle felt it was time to take independent action. He directed the fireman and the oiler to evacuate. Aware that another torpedo could detonate the engine room at any instant, Pyle swiftly cut off the oil supply to the fires and closed the throttle causing the massive pistons to gradually come to a halt due to lack of steam. Ascending to the open deck, he looked for Chief Engineer James Thurman, but he was nowhere to be found. The ship was in total blackout. No lights were visible on deck. Pyle stumbled into a Navy gunner and both fell. He then located his cabin, 
grabbed a life jacket and his maritime documents, and rushed to his designated emergency station at the motor lifeboat. The boat was already being lowered when he climbed in. The night was tranquil, enabling them to launch the boat smoothly. Upon starting the engine, Pyle took stock and counted 15 on board, including Chief Mate Carlin, radio operator Tilden, deck engineer Paul M. Mitchum, assorted crew, a few soldiers, and Navy gunners. Carlin, as the highest ranking officer, assumed command and steered toward cries for help in the water. Meanwhile, back on the Jean Nicolet, Captain Nilsson was assessing the ship's damage. One torpedo had struck the starboard side near the forward hold, and another near the aft hold. The ship was listing at 20 degrees and the angle was worsening. Lieutenant Junior Grade Gerald Deal joined the captain to dispose of the ship's confidential papers and codes, readying them to be tossed overboard in a weighted box if evacuation was needed. Some members of the Navy Armed Guard were already assembled on the boat deck, prepared to leave the ship upon receiving orders. Among them was Captain John J. Gussick, the senior army officer present. He was struck by the calm demeanor displayed by the young sailors, some still in their adolescence. They just stood there quietly waiting for orders, he recounted. One of the boys was saying, let's stay on board. We got to get some shots off at those bastards. Three lifeboats were deployed and multiple rafts were released, floating in proximity and tethered to the ship by lengthy ropes. Lieutenant Deal descended the ladder from the bridge inquiring about his crew. The coxswain confirmed that all armed guards were safe and accounted for. One after another, sailors descended via scramble nets or slid down the lifeboat ropes into the water, making their way to the nearby rafts. Once the ship was fully evacuated, the chief mate's boat held 22 individuals, packed beyond what would be comfortable for an extended journey. However, they wouldn't remain in that boat for long. For around 10 minutes, they floated about 100 yards away from the Jean Nicolet. Observing that the ship's list had stabilized and it was unlikely to sink, Carlin proposed returning to collect additional food and water. Just as the lifeboat reached the ship, a flare of fire burst on the horizon, succeeded by the unmistakable echo of artillery. Pyle restarted the engine to distance the boat from the ship. In the process, they narrowly avoided colliding with a small raft carrying Captain Nilsson and two others, who were then brought aboard the lifeboat. Meanwhile, a distant submarine continued its barrage, landing 10 shots into the incapacitated ship. Whenever the moon momentarily penetrated the cloudy night, they could see the silhouette of the Japanese I-boat. Following the bombardment, the submarine cautiously circled the blazing Jean Nicolet several times. The I-boat commander was wary, perhaps suspecting that some of the armaments were still operational and manned, posing a potential threat if the submarine ventured too close. By 10 p.m., convinced that the ship was deserted, the submarine approached the trio of lifeboats. A raft carrying Lieutenant Deal, Captain Gussick, and 12 Navy gunners had drifted farther away. From the conning tower of the I-boat, an officer commanded in English that all boats come alongside and that everyone should board. He specifically instructed Carlin's boat to approach first, as Carlin maneuvered the boat alongside the curved hull of the I-boat, a sailor tossed them a rope. It seemed most of the enemy crew had assembled on deck, peering down at them, laughing and conversing animatedly. The crew of the Jean Nicolet observed that the Japanese sailors were armed with knives, clubs, wrenches, and sections of pipe. It was a moment that no one can fully describe, said Jack C. Van Ness, one of the merchant crew. My heart was pounding. I had a feeling that something terrible was going to happen. I think the others felt that way too. Nobody spoke. Everyone was solemn and tense. Two Japanese seamen grabbed the first man aboard and tossed him toward other crewmen, who went through his pockets for money and seamen's papers. They took his watch, tore off a ring, and took his life preserver. Then, they bound his hands behind him with wire and pushed him toward the forward deck. The third or fourth man to go aboard was one of the youngest members of the Jean Nicolet's crew a 16-year-old messman named Paul Reiser. First, they pushed him around, recalls Van Ness. Then, they bound his hands behind his back and shoved him forward. I guess he didn't move fast enough, because an officer who was standing nearby seemed to go nuts. He shouted and screamed. Then, he ran up to the kid, pulled out a revolver, and shot him in the head. The kid fell down and tumbled over the side. Engineer Pyle was ascending onto the deck just as the young man's body disappeared into the ocean beside him. 
While the men were being escorted onto the submarine's deck and restrained, someone on board remembered the distant raft, about 200 yards away. The Japanese cast a spotlight across the water, eventually locating the raft. The same officer who had previously barked commands to the lifeboats now ordered the raft to draw near. A gun was aimed at the raft to ensure compliance. Seizing a brief gap in the spotlight's illumination, Lieutenant Junior Grade Deal and three others quietly slipped into the water and swam into the dark abyss. The remaining individuals paddled towards the submarine and were brought on board under the watchful eye of a submachine gun to ensure obedience. Seaman Harold Lee jumped into the sea before his hands were bound, swimming underwater until he was safely distant from the submarine. He treaded water and dog paddled until a rescue vessel picked him up the following morning. The submarine's forward deck was packed with 95 men, seated cross-legged, four in each row, all facing the ship's bow. Several already showed signs of abuse, bearing bruises and bleeding from strikes to the head, neck, shoulders, and back. The Japanese commander walked through the captive assembly, instructing the captain and the chief engineer to identify themselves. Upon doing so, each was guided to the conning tower and taken below deck. They were never seen again. At this juncture, the crew faced questioning about the Jean Nicolet's cargo and its intended destination. Gusak later recounted the moment. As far as I could hear, the Japs didn't get any information that would be of much use to them. The men weren't very cooperative, and some of them got hit with pipes and wrenches for not answering questions. You had to be proud of these men, all of them. They were in the hands of cruel, sadistic captors, but they didn't talk. I don't know just what heroes are supposed to be made of, but we sure had a bunch of them there that night. Gusick was just behind Robert Neuville, a young Navy seaman, first class. When Neville leaned back to ease the pain of his cramped position, a sailor hit him over the shoulders with a pipe to force him erect. That just made Neville mad, Gusek said. He cursed the Jap who hit him and leaned back again. The sailor hit him again, harder. Neville leaned back again and got a vicious whack on his head. This punishment continued until Neville finally fell down on the deck and his tormentor turned to someone else. One young Japanese sailor kept strutting among the seated men with a bayonet. He would lunge, thrust the bayonet at someone and yell, Japan, Japan, Japan rule the world. After the interrogations finished, the submarine shelled the Jean Nicolet again and forced the captives to watch the shelling. Those who did not understand the command to watch the destruction of their ship were kicked in the ribs or hit with clubs. Shortly after, the submarine picked up speed, causing the bow wave to surge over the deck. Gusick witnessed two men being swept away by the water. One of them had deliberately used the moment to escape into the sea. Around 2300 hours, the Japanese crew initiated a horrifying spree of torment and execution. Equipped with pipes, clubs, knives, and bayonets, 16 of the I-boat's crew members took positions on the deck, evenly spaced on both sides. They then began to prod the prisoners on the forward deck to their feet, escorting them to the aft section one by one. The harrowing cries and screams that emanated from the back of the submarine left no doubt in the minds of those still on the forward deck about the sadistic acts being committed aft. As the captured men were made to run this cruel gauntlet, they were subjected to kicks, clubbings, stabbings, and ultimately were cast overboard, each without a life jacket and their hands bound behind their backs. Pyle later recounted his experience to Navy investigators. There were about 30 of us left on the foredeck when I was jerked to my feet and led aft. When I finally saw what had caused all the screams and curses and cries from my shipmates, I stopped momentarily. Was I really awake? Was I really seeing this? Or was I just dreaming a terrible nightmare that had to go away? I didn't have time to size up the situation. I was struck a terrific blow at the base of my skull. It made me feel like a bouncing ball. Someone gave me a shove in the middle of the back, and I careened down the line while the sailors rained blows on me. Every one of them must have hit me. Somehow I stumbled past the last man and fell into what seemed to be a white, foaming sea. I lost consciousness, but the cold water revived me. When I came to the surface, I felt a terrible thumping in my head, and I couldn't see too well. But I had a terrific desire to stay alive and started treading water. There were cries for help around me, but there wasn't a thing I could do. 
Approximately 60 men had endured the gauntlet, ultimately being cast overboard either lifeless, on the brink of death, or severely battered. Abruptly, shouts in Japanese emanated from the submarine's conning tower. Stanley Wyrazunski, a third-class Navy gunner's mate, later explained the situation to formal interrogators. We heard the distant hum of airplane engines. A siren went off, and moments later the sub started to dive. The Japs on deck disappeared down the hatches. It all happened in seconds. Pretty soon the deck was awash and I was sitting in water. Then, the suction took me down. I was tossed around and thrown against the deck gun, and I went down, down, down. There was a full moon, and I could see the moon from underwater. I thought it would be the last sight I'd see in this world. I couldn't hold my breath any longer, and I opened my mouth and swallowed a lot of water. I was swept along the deck and up against the conning tower when the sub took a deep diving angle. I kicked against the conning tower, and I guess that's what sent me up. How wonderful it was when I reached the surface and got a lung full of fresh air. I kept jerking hard on my hands while I was treading water. Finally, my right hand came free. I kicked off my clothes and started to swim. There was yelling and cries for help all around me. The aircraft overhead circled for a while and I saw it several times when it broke through clouds into patches of moonlight. The aviators answering the Jean Nicolet's distress signal couldn't spot the survivors, but the blazing vessel provided a pinpoint for their location. Within five minutes, though, the aircraft departed from the area. Captain Gusick futilely tugged at his restraints and called out for assistance. There is nothing else you can do, so you just yell like hell until your voice gives out, he recalled. After an hour, someone swam up to me and untied the rope around my wrists. It took him about 20 minutes and it must have taken some acrobatics to do it. I never did know who it was. When I was free, he said, Okay, buddy, and swam off to help someone else. I decided at that point that the ship was the best place to be. I knew that when it sank, hatchboards and things would float off and I'd have something to hold on to. I struck out for the ship, maybe half a mile away. I swam all night but never made it. The current was too strong for me. Gunner's mate Stanley Wyrazumski ensured the survival of Pyle, civilian employee Archie Howard, and seaman Robert Butler by loosening the wire and rope binding their wrists. Butler, who had sustained a bayonet slash to his head, remained afloat on his back throughout the night, reassuring his mates that they would all make it. As he sat on the deck of the I-boat, George Hess, a member of the merchant crew, persistently gnawed at his restraints using his fingernails. When the submarine submerged, he gave the rope a forceful pull, freeing his hands. One of the Japs was in such a hurry to dive down the hatch when the alarm sounded that he dropped a long knife. I grabbed it and started sawing at the ropes on a guy next to me. Another man was strapped with wire, and I couldn't do anything for him. I guess I must have cut three or four loose before we all went under. The Jean Nicolet went under after daybreak, and by late morning, crates, hatch covers, and wooden fragments from the bracing and packing material were adrift on the ocean. Lee was clutching a box when he heard Gunner Butler's pleas for assistance. Lee navigated the box toward Butler, helping him gain a grip on it, then swam through the scattered debris until he discovered a board that offered some buoyancy for himself. Engineer Pyle had been in the water for an extended period and was nearing his breaking point. I kept mumbling to myself. I'll make it. I'll make it. But it was getting harder every minute. I started thinking of my family and wondering if they would ever know what became of me when someone grabbed me and helped me get a hold on a floating hatchboard. One more minute and I think I'd have been gone. Able seaman Stuart Venderhurst appeared just in the nick of time. Earlier in the evening, he'd slipped off the submarine's bow undetected during a surge that washed over the foredeck his loosely tied restraints allowed him to release himself and float on his back. His captors had missed a small pocket knife in his work pants, which he used to sever the rope's binding engineer pile. Soon after the submarine dove, multiple men were left adrift. Those who had been severely injured while running the gauntlet couldn't endure long. The physical toll of staying buoyant, coupled with the seeming futility of their plight, led to additional casualties. Around 900 hours the next day, another aircraft circled the vicinity multiple times, dropping an inflatable raft, life jackets, sustenance, and water. By early afternoon, seven survivors had located the raft. Captain Gusick, Venderhurst, Butler, Mitchum, Pyle, Nouvel, and Wyrazunski. 
others grabbed life jackets or sizable debris. The aircraft guided rescue vessels to the location, and at 10 hundred hours on July 4th, the armed fishing boat Hucksack of the Indian Navy arrived. They collected survivors and scoured the area for any overlooked individuals. The ocean was placid, and it seemed unlikely anyone had been missed when the Hucksack set course for Adu Atoll. The survivors were disembarked on July 5th, later transported to Colombo, and eventually repatriated to the United States. In total, 22 men emerged from this maritime ordeal. 10 from the armed guard, 9 from the merchant crew, 2 from the army unit, and 1 civilian. That anyone survived speaks volumes to the resilience, grit, and bravery exhibited during a night of terror in the Indian Ocean. Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe. See you soon.